name is Tom, Tom Bergley. I'm from Norway. Uh, living, been living in Austin for approximately four years now. Um, my background is from newspaper production and design. Back in, I was working for Computer World Norway, the Norwegian edition, for many, many years. And I ven ventured into teaching my colleagues, and I was teaching uh, others. And uh, my main line of work now is actually uh, being a course instructor. So I'm certified Adobe instructor in InDesign, Photoshop, Illustrator, and Acrobat. I also teach stuff like FrameMaker and, uh, and other stuff like graphic design and, and, and generally stuff like that. I've also written a few textbooks and, uh, well, um, if somebody knows somebody who wants to pay for translating those books from Norwegian into English, I uh, would we'll, we'll much like to talk to them. All right. So um, we're going to, <coughs> this is kind of interesting, going to be an interesting little project because um, uh, I've been doing several InDesign presentations over here. So yeah, that's probably the first for me. Yeah. So, um, and we always try to focus on like advanced features and new features or stuff like that. But then Donna asked me to, because if some members have requested that, why don't we talk about the basic workflow and the basic operations of the program. So that's what we're going to do the first part here. And my aim for today, if we can do that in one and a half hours, it is from scratch, uh, create a textbook like this, like a, you know, with all the, uh, all the wells and whistles, <laughs> and whistles with, uh, you know, headers, footers, page numbers, all the styles and everything. So we're going to do that from scratch. Now, there was a little memory stick going around here and What's on that stick is there's no images there. There's no photo. Yeah, it's right here. So there's no photo. I, I skipped the pictures because it's uh, because it's uh, uh, it takes too much space, right? So, uh, but but the, I think it's three stages of this production is actually on that stick. None of them are complete. They're they're like the initial state, and then we have the, the uh, you know the styles in there, and then the the layout of the so, uh, it, it, so the final, I mean, the, the most developed version is not even complete. So it's, it looks a little bit like this. So um, with that said, it's, it's uh, kind of interesting. It's a kind of project that uh, InDesign is very well suited for. You know, InDesign is a specialized tool for all kinds of print publications. So uh, from the tiniest little business card to large encyclopedias. So it, it can scale from small to big and, and back and forth. And some of the new features that we got that some of us have been missing is like just a simple way to add a little vertical bar next to a quote, for instance, like that without having to draw it manually. That's one of the things that was been added recently. And, and these are the this is the stuff we're going to work with. Uh, and uh, and uh, oh, I, I suddenly realized I probably forgot to put the work file on that member stick, but that's uh, you, we're going to have to do without that. So there you go. So this is what my plan, that's, that's the plan, and that's what we're going to try to do. And if you want to try to uh, follow here and try to do this, um, of course, you're more than welcome to do so. But um, uh, if, if I'm going too fast, there's a lot of catch-up files there on the memories thing, right? You can, you can, you know, uh, let me see if I have that little folder over here with the, yeah, these are the files that I put in the, uh, on the memory stick, it's like it's like where's an A, B, and C. A, B, and C. It's like three different stages of the whole whole design process. Okay, so um, so I have the finished file over here. So I, I think I'm going to keep that open for reference in case I I forget something. Uh, I could just cheat and look look at what I've already done. But uh, there's a lot of things that goes into a project like this. You know, it's all in the planning and and. Uh, I have, uh, I'm kind of analog kind of person, so I like to do sketches on paper and write and draw and stuff like that. So this is, this is my, this is the general idea of the whole thing. Uh, so this picture is not included on the memory stick either, but it's, it's like I've got all the dimensions, all the positions. I'm using inches here. I switch between pikers and inches because they are interchangeable and sort of. So, uh, well, there's six pikers to an inch, so you can take it from there. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, this for this project, I'm using basically uh, uh, inches, you know, to keep it simple. 
So this is, I have a, this is a, just a snapshot I took of the actual, this is my notes, literally, for this project. So, so hopefully I'll be able to read my own notes here as we go along. And, uh, of course, that might uh, be, you know, turn into something like this. Uh, you, you need to have a, uh, you need to have a plan, you need to have some contents. In this case, I, I stole some, or borrowed, rather, some contents from Wikipedia just to have some real text. I'm kind of tired of using the Lorem Ipsum, you know, uh, thing that you can get. It's, you know, the whole works of, of, of the old philosopher Cicero is actually included in Endesign. You can just add, fill this, fill this chapter with mum, mumble jumble Latin text, you know. So I took uh, the effort to go in there and and copy some text from uh, not very random uh, thing about Julius in, in Wikipedia, and I, I kind of edited it a little bit. So there's a lot of things that go into this, and 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 uh, I think a wise man once said, if you you don't know where you're going, you'll end up somewhere else. Right? So. Um, so it's all in the planning. You need a sketch. You need an idea. I want the wide margins for quotes and images and captions and and stuff like that. And I want those to to follow. You know. So when I have like something in here and I have uh, like a little pull quote or something, I I will I want the option. Is this quote directly linked to that text? It should be follow. You know, moving with the text in case I do edits to the text or should it be static to the page and sit here on the top of the page, whether I, you know, no matter what happens to the body type here in, in, in the story. So, uh, and of course you have both options in InDesign. So, so there you go. So a lot of things to think about. So with that said, yeah, is there, is there a question, a comment? Can you show us how to do that? Do what? To have that where it goes along with. Yes. <laughs> Let's hope, uh, we should have time. This is just a, just going to make a textbook from scratch and, I mean, how long did it take? So, uh, and if you look at the, uh, a little detail here that you might find interesting, and I really hope we get to that, it's, um, it's like the running header footers here. I can do the full screen again. You know, InDesign has a full screen presentation mode. I love it when I'm doing presentations and teaching, but also when I'm showing projects to my clients, you know, you don't necessarily have to create a, a PDF just to show it. If you see over here, there's the chapter name and the section name is up there in the top left. And then you have the, you see the subtitle over here, you know, the, the level two headline is repeated automatically up there. You can, you, can, you, you can have that in design, pull that out automatically from the text and, and display it there. So if I go to move to the next page here, you see it's now we're, we're still in the same chapter, but now it's in the subsection. Intensity, and over here it's like comic panels. It will use the, the, level, the level one and level two headlines to, to put that text in there automatically. So that's uh, something called the text variables, and it's uh, fairly easy to, to use. Now, so what is in a template? What is really, I mean, what would you say you need to know? Well, I've said a lot already, but you know, the first thing we need to do is to get the dimensions right. Know, the, the, the trim size, the final size of the publication, and um, and the margins, and and all that. That, that. that will be the first component of a template, or a design for that matter. And then the second thing would might be the colors. You need a color scheme, and you need to enter uh, and define the colors, so you don't really have to do that repeatedly. Uh, for every new chapter or for every new book, you can, you can share that information across uh, documents and you also need to make it consistent, right? And now the third thing that is very important would be the topography, obviously. So in this document, and that's what we're going to do in a moment, we're going to start making uh, a small set of, of paragraph styles. Uh, uh, InDesign is based on using uh, paragraph styles systematically, but it doesn't ship with anyone, any paragraph styles. And those new templates that have been become available recently from from the uh, uh, stock uh, Adobe Stock thing, uh, some of them have like a very very good uh, scheme of, of using paragraph styles, and some don't. 
thing. And some have like 200 styles and no way, you have no idea what they're going to be used for. And if you don't know what styles are or are curious about that, I, I will explain that a little bit later. Now, so those three element are, elements are the most important ones. And then, of course, is the, um, uh, like, a design elements, like a page numbering and, and the header and footer and stuff like that. And there's, there's a lot of things that go into this. So with that said, I'm going to start creating a new document, just file a new document over here. And of course, we get the new, new document dialog box. This, is, this, this dialog box has changed. And uh, it, it basically contains all the, well, the good thing is that you can resize it, resize it like I just did. But also, um, they, it's basically the same as before. It's just got this uh, access to all these templates. You can go in here, and you can go online, and you can go in here and, and find something. And some of it you can use, and some of it you cannot use. It's like all kinds of things in here. And uh, one little spooky thing here is that uh, a lot of these templates are free. That freaks me out. Because they have this little spot there for a price, right? So we don't know how long they're going to remain free. They, I, I'm sure this is a business. Uh, this is like a profit center for Adobe, is my guess. You know, that before too long we will see, and maybe they're all even here if I scroll down there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You, you better be a, be a template hoarder while you can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but but the rest of the options here are the same as before. If you might, if you've seen the the old smaller little dialog box for a new document, there's one exception. They messed up the order of the margins. And can you imagine why they did that? You know, it's, it's top, bottom, inside, outside. And if you go in, and I'm going to show you this. Uh, if you want to change the margins after the fact, or if you use the old dialog box, it's top. So when I do what I just did, I have this little thing. Uh, I have my little shorthand here. Uh, this is my little shorthand for the margins, right? Just do those little quadrants. But now I have to, I have to write top, bottom, inside, outside. Before I, I didn't have to do that before because there, it was consistent, right? But for some reason, they've changed the order of them. And, and you know, why? Uh, there's no benefit for anybody in, in so we, I'm going to do a custom size here. I'm going to do 8.25 8 inches wide. And I'm going to do 9.75 uh, tall. And um, this is, uh, I'm not sure how usual that, that format is, but I, I found a, one of my favorite books in my own bookshelf had of that, of that, those dimensions. So I'm sticking with that. I want I want to add a few pages here to begin with. I want 12 pages. Uh, it's very easy to add or delete or move around, shuffle around pages after you created the documents. So it doesn't really matter, but I just want a little, you know, a few pages there so I can see what I'm doing, right? And I want to start on page one, and and this is an, and I definitely want facing pages. That's like a left hand page and a right hand page. So if you turn that off, you will only get one, you know. Uh, single side pages but and this is an exception to to the rule for me I want this time what they call a primary text frame and the use the reason it's turned off by default and the reason I hardly ever use it is that I usually create like newspaper or magazine like uh, designs with lots of frames and lots of pictures and move things around and and what this function does is to create one big uh, text frame on every page in the document. But now I can use that. I, I want to have a main flow of text throughout my document. Well, I want the wide margins for other stuff, but I want to create automatically one big flow that will ease my work you know, with, with creating this, this stuff. So that's the primary text frame. How does that know the size and shape of the primary text frame? How does InDesign know the shape of the primary text frame? Uh, I'm basically telling, telling okay. InDesign how to do it. Doesn't but it just go to the margin? yes, you do it indirectly because it's the it's the trim size of the paper, and you subtract the margins, and the rest is going to be the the main flow. 
So there's no place you can enter a, a number for the width of that column. Now, what is new this fall is, yeah, go on. Yeah, it's actually, it will be on the master pages as well, but it, it, yeah, but it will, it will, they will be linked, you know, so if you paste something, it will flow through the whole document, yeah. Now, new this fall, you know, the one of the latest, latest additions they made is, is they developed this automatic uh, layout adjustment thing. So if you, if you create a master, a primary text frame, it used to be called master text frame, uh, if you create a primary text frame and you go and change the margins, uh, it will be updated all through the document. So it's a little bit easier to maintain than before. Okay, so I'm going to have one column uh, for the margins, and now I really have to focus here because uh, they changed the order, like I said. So I'm going to have the top margin, 1.25. Uh, yeah, and you see this little little link here, this little chain. I'm going to break that link. So because it's just a shortcut to make all the four values the same, and of course I don't want that. I want the top to be 1.25. I want the bottom here to be 1. One little thing, if you're... Hmm? Oh, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Exactly, because I'm following my, you know, I, I just said it, but, you know, I'm already confused. So bottom should be there, and the other one should be there. So inside here is going to be 1, and outside is going to be 2.5 inches. So this is, I've been working on this a little bit. It's, uh, it's a little bit inspired by the book I mentioned that I found in my own bookshelf, but I made the, I changed the dimension a little bit, because, you know, you're always aiming for perfection, and, you know, so, so you want to wanna improve on it. So um, this is looking pretty good. I think this is, uh, this should do it. Um, the uh, Bleed and Slug sounds like a horror movie. Uh, I'm not going to use that now. But both of those functions, and they are totally independent of each other, so they will both build outside the trim size of the pages. So they will increase the size, printed size, beyond the trim size of your, of your document. You only need it if you're going to have pictures or colors or something like that to extend all the way to the edge of the paper. And then you need to go a little bit beyond that, too, so it, so it prints well. And slug is uh, similarly just to uh, include a printable area outside the trim area. Usually, basically, for, if you want to have a message for the printer or something like that, you can add a little field on top of And then when you create the PDF, you have the option, do you want to include, include that slug area? Yes, no, you know, so, so, so I'm gonna, uh, not going to use any of this right now, but I just want to talk about it. Now, uh, we got back the little preview here. It doesn't really matter right now because I have I made the dialog box so big anyway, so I won't be able to see anything. But the, if you turn on the preview thing here, it will start building your your document already. So you can sometimes you can detect little mistakes you make, like if I switch the top and bottom or whatever. Maybe I can detect that before I uh, I go there. But at this point, I'm gonna click create, and I will get my uh, new document. And you see, I got this wide margin here. Um, I'm gonna reset my workspace here to get back to the uh, to clean it up a little bit here. So I, now I got the physical dimensions and the trim size, but uh, I haven't got much. And and here I got the uh, I got the margins, and and it's just the the difference between this page width and the two margins. And in this case, you can read up here. I end up on at uh, 4.75 inches. So that's the width of that column. But that was, uh, I didn't even know that. I, I did put it here because I did measure it, so I have it down here, that, so I know how wide they are. And uh, I want a, a 1.75 inch field over here, but you can't really see it now. There's, uh, there's something more work I need to do, right? So I'm gonna go here. Well, you can flip through the pages. And in InDesign, you, do, you don't use the page down or page up keys. You hold the alt or option key when you do that. You have, if you do the alt page down and page up or option page down and page up, you will you know, flip through the document from one spread to another. And spread is the two, one, two, or more pages that belong together, like this, a left-hand and a right-hand page. Okay? So, uh, and by the way, if I go here now just to show you the, the margins and column setting, and go figure, here's got top, bottom, inside, outside, the, it, the opposite order. This is the way it used to be, so I don't know why they even messed it up. 
maybe they hired some um, uh, temporary person to just put it in there or something. I don't know. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to make changes that will apply to all my pages. So uh, when you put stuff like header, footer, or even guides, I'm going to manually place some guides out here that I want to be uh, able to show on all pages. You don't do that on the individual pages. You know? So what, when I'm teaching InDesign, I, I, I try to remind my students all the time that if you're ever catching yourself doing repetitive work, whatever it is, you, you do the same thing over again. You define the same color definitions again. You know, we enter the same color definitions or you, you, you know, you're doing it wrong because there's always a way to repurpose and share and reuse stuff, right? And in this case, what we're going to do here is to not do, make any changes to the document pages. We're going to go to the master page. If you see, the, it's called a master at this point. You can rename it if you want and you can create more master pages as you need them. But that little A, you see all these pages in my document have that little A at the top left or top right. That means that there's a, there's a parent-child relationship between the master and the children. You know, the master here and the document pages. So I just double click here to move on to my master page. And now I'm going to do one thing that is an optional step. I'm going to go to my layers panel. You know, layers is just you can build your document in in like uh, in like layers or you know floors, and you can you can uh, one of the advantages of using layers is that you can re reorganize the stacking order, but you can also show, hide, or even lock what's on the layer. So this step is basically optional, but I'm going to do it uh, definitely do it now. Um, so I'm going to create a layer. I'm going to look at my little cheat sheet here and see um, um, uh, how I'm going to do it. So I've, I'm going to uh, place a lot of uh, guides here, you know, manually positioned guides on the page. And the reason I'm putting it on the layer is that I will be able to hide them, or you know, uh, individually. So I'm going to go here and just uh, uh, create a new layer. I can double click here to name it, and I'm going to do it, uh, name it. Uh, um, I'm just going to call it guides, header, footer. So uh, and this is this is definitely uh, optional, like I said. But it, it's a, it's a good habit sometimes to use layers. You can have literally have as many layers as you want. If you make too many, you're gonna just create problems for yourself. So I'm gonna uh, create a little a couple of placeholders here for me to use when I'm I'm positioning those uh, headers and footers. Okay. So uh, you see, I'm dragging down from the ruler a guide. And if I'm on the left-hand side, it's showing here. And if I go over here, it's showing there. So I, what I'm going to do, there's two ways you can make that uh, guide span the whole uh, spread. One way is to press down the controller or the command key. The other is to move the mouse pointer up, if you can, over to the pasteboard in the background. Right? Yeah. So uh, I have a little, uh, my little notes here. The first guide is going to be on a quarter of an inch. It's going to be 0 0.25. Remember when you place and um, place a guide, it gets selected. And it's showing red now because that's the uh, ID color of that layer. It's not, it's not going to print at all. Uh, but when it's selected, you can see the values and the position of them, right? So you can even move it, and if, if you didn't hit like 0 0.25 inches correctly, you can you can go in here and type in or, you know, and move that guide using numbers instead of using the mouse. Uh, my next one is going to be uh, 0. Point, uh, what is this? <laughs> zero, 0 inches and 625. So uh, I'm not sure exactly how I ended up on that number. And I couldn't position it there. So I'm just going to go in here and trust myself with that and, and put in 0 0.625. All right. So then I had to use that number thing, you know, to, to position it there correctly. Then I also want, um, uh, at the bottom, I want uh, a guide down here to help me position the page numbers. And that's going to be exactly at 9 inches. If you have problems positioning these guides, you can press down the, uh, the shift key. It will snap to the nearest 
indicator on the rulers. So that's a that's a nifty little shortcut you know, to, to make sure you you hit it correctly. So these are the guides I'm going to use for um, the header and footers. Now I'm generous with myself creating more layers. You know you can bypass that double click. You, you know I had to double click to name my layer. Um, if you hold the Alt or Option key down when you click the New button, you, you, you save a double click. How cool is that? You, it opens up the dialog box directly. It happens with a lot of things, like when you're creating uh, styles and colors and everything. So this is going to be Guides Sidebar. Okay? So I want a separate layer for my Sidebar Guides. You might say this is a little overkill, but I'm going to show you in a minute why I'm doing it. So, this is going to be in the, you know, help to position objects here in the, in the sidebars correctly. So to make it uh, quick and easy here, I'm going to drag one down, hold down the controller command key to make it span the whole. You know, I just want an extension of that top of the main frame, right? And I don't need that at the bottom, but I do need, um, I need some vertical ones. So I'm going to do here, I have the values, half an inch. That should be easy. Over here, I'm going to have one right here in the position 2.25. So I can hold the shift key again because that will help me find that 2.25 thing over there. And I'm going to do similarly on the other side. So I'm going to go over here and it should be 9.25. I'm glad I have my notes now. Hold on, Tom. Why were you holding down the shift key to see the. Oh, the shift key will make the position snap to. Oh, so snap. It's, a, yeah, it's a snap thing. You don't, the shift key, will all, that's the only thing it does. Okay. And because the number of uh, dividers or little, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the ruler changes when you zoom, that shift will actually change when you zoom as well. So, but it will only snap to those that are visible here. So I don't know why I said, oh, these are, yeah. So let me place, this is 14.25 um, over there. Then I need one more over here. It's going to be at exactly 16 inches. Now, to help me uh, a little bit more, in case I want to create little frames in here, uh, I'm, I'm just going to quick and easy position a guide here in the extension of the inner margin on both pages. So I know there's a lot of lot of uh, guides here, and that's one of the reasons I I put them on layers, right? Because I don't want these lines. Uh, you know, uh, obscuring my view and come, going, coming in my way, you know. So up here, I can show and hide those sidebar guides, right? I can show them when I need them, and I can hide them when I don't need them. And the same thing goes here for the guides at the top and the bottom for the header and footer. At this point, I think it's uh, about time I save my document because... Um, something goes wrong. I don't want to have to do this all over again. So this is the this is the uh, the starting point, right? This is the this is the uh, now I got most of my my stuff in here. I haven't there's no contents yet, but I know now if I go over to my document pages here, you can double click uh, an individual page, or you can double click the page numbers four dash five, for instance, to see the whole spread. So uh, the, the Pages panel is very versatile. There's all kinds of weird things you can do in here. And you can change it, and you can display them in, in, in uh, huge little, you know, huge thumbnails and show them horizontally and all that stuff. So it's, it's, it's really, really cool. And that's also the, the panel you use if you want to rearrange the order of the pages. You just drag them around in there. Okay. So I think we got the most of the basic uh, geometry in place here. I can't see anything uh, uh, important that's missing. So uh, we're going to move on. So um, the next thing, I'm just going to move over here to page one, not for any particular reason, but I don't want to risk putting, you know, whatever you put on the master pages will be replicated on the document pages. It's like a real genetic, uh, like a DNA uh, parent-child thing over there. So the next thing I'm going to do is to create a couple of colors. And I have a, uh, my notes here. Is I'm just going to create two, one like an orange type of color and a blue kind of color. So if you open up the swatches panel, that's where you, you work with colors. There is a panel in InDesign called color. 
and uh, personally, I don't know anybody who's using it. It's uh, um, it's interesting if you go here to the advanced preset workspace. That color is not showing. You know? really? But if you go to the uh, what they call essentials, which is kind of mis misleading word. Oh, they changed it. I'm sorry, they changed it recently. So it, it, it they they're not using even there. They're not even using the uh, uh, you know using the color uh, panel anymore. So uh, most importantly, you can create your own. That's not part of this presentation, but you can create your own workspace. All you have to do is rearrange these panels and move them around and open them up and stack them here. And then you can just go to that menu and say new workspace and you name it. You can have as many as you want. Of course, if you're sharing workstation with colleagues, uh, some, some people do in the newspaper, we did that. We didn't know what workstation we're going to do the next day. You, you can create your own personal little uh, set up of panels, you know, it's like furnishing a room to your own uh, preferences. So the paper, the colors we have in here are really not very uh, attractive colors. It's the CMYK and the RGB colors, in addition to black and one funny little color called paper. And um, we don't use white in InDesign. You can create a color and call it white if you really, really want to. But you know, when you think about it, when did you last see like a printed pu print publication that was actually printed with white ink? You know, it doesn't happen a lot. We use white ink for uh, screen printing, like on objects like pens and stuff like that, but uh, not really in four color printing. We don't print. So the color you will see where you apply that color will be the paper color. Hence the uh, uh, hence the name. These colors that have the the brackets. You're not allowed to delete them. There are like functions, uh, just as much as colors. Uh, but you can change the appearance of the paper. So if you double click the paper, uh, let's say you're laying out something like Financial Times or you want the paper to look like it's uh, you know, uh, pink or orange or something like that, you can, you can change the appearance of paper. Uh, it will not even print. It's just like something you want to see on your screen, right? I'm going to undo that. It makes me seasick. You, you know, you can check. It will not print. It's not a print color. It's just maybe you want your publication to look more like if you, if you know you're going to print on like dark like gray paper or blue paper or whatever, you can change that. It's just a, just a visual thing. So, but you can't delete it. But you can delete all the other ones that, that are created down here. So, we don't really want the CMYK and the RGB colors. We don't want to use them unless we really have to. So I want to create a new color, but the new button is grayed out. Why on earth is this grayed out? And I don't know the answer to that, except that I'm on paper, and you can't create a duplicate of the, this color because it's a special color, right? Um, and the funny thing is I can go to the panel flyout menu and, and select new color swords anyway. So why are they mocking me here and trying to tell me I cannot create a new color? So if you select a different color, like a regular color, you will be able to click that little button. But when you have any of these, the no color or the registration or black, you know, one of these colors, well, you are allowed to make a duplicate of black. But it's so weird because no matter what you do, you can, you can still go here and create a new color swatch. You all, in this case, yeah, that was interesting. This is the uh, this is a totally meaningless color. It's 100 percent of everything, and of course, you shouldn't use that for anything except that is what the registration color looks like. And even more, the registration color is not a color; it's a function. If you want, you know, in the printing plate, you you usually print like cyan, magenta, and yellow and black printing plate. So if you apply the registration color, it will be printed on all plates. In the so don't use it unless you really know what you're doing. And if you have spot colors in addition to that, like a, like a PMS, uh, Pantone color or something, the registration, if you apply the registration color, it will be printed on all those plates as well. So that's what that color is for. And, and people have asked, uh, Adobe, can you please remove that color? Because people want to use black and then they use this color instead. And, and, and add it more like a function on the flyout menu for special interest people, but no, it's still here. And people keep using it because they can't differentiate between the registration and the black because they look the same, right? So this is like a silly, silly, uh, I'm 
just going to do zeros here to begin with. So um, you have an option to name your color, or you can just keep those CMYK values. And in this case, I have one orange color. It's 0, 40, uh, 90, and 0. Uh, and we always use the same order, CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, black. It's like universal kind of thing. Sometimes you get the colors. You see up at the top of the screen now it says C equals and M equals. Sometimes people skip the C, M, Y, K letters, and, but it's still the same order, right? And you have to include the zeros, or else we, we, you would get confused. There's always four values. So uh, this is my orange. I want to call this, so I'm, I, I don't want the color value. I want to call this color A. And I want to add it. So if you, if you have a long list of colors you want to create, you can create them in one go. You just go in here, and you can keep going here. So now I'm going to create color B. Um, that's going to be a blue one. And that's going to be 90 uh, percent cyan, 30 here, and um, 35 over here. It's like a greenish kind of. So I can keep going here and add colors. I've, uh, based on experience, I, I try not to name, uh, I try to use as generic names as possible. So it's logo color one, logo color two. I don't use like, this is orange, this is blue, because if you change it, you're going to create a mess, right? Same with, uh, with, with typographical styles. I don't call them like Garama nine point or something like that, because I've been teaching at newspapers, I can win there, hey, Hey, this style says body type 8.25, you know, points, but it's 10 points. Yeah, we know, but we, the production system is based on this, so we can't change the name, right? So, so you know, so I'm, I'm just using generic names here, you know, color A, color B. I like using tints, so I'm going to make a couple of tints here of my first color. I just select the color, and I select from the menu, new tint swatch which means a lighter, like a reduced version. I'm going to do 75% over here. I'm going to add that. I'm going to create a 50%, and I'm going to add that. Unfortunately, I can't switch colors here, so i just going to say I'm done. Select the color B and uh, create a couple of tints here as well. It's very nice to be able to use a, a lighter version of the color. Here's 50%, and here's 75%. Now, you see when you create a tent, it's, it's, again, it's like a genetic thing. It's like a parent-child again. I can't change anything here. I'm not allowed to change anything here, not even the name or anything, except for that tent percentage. You can use tents uh, without, uh, so I'm going to add this, and I'm going to say I'm done. You can use tents of any color on any object just by uh, changing the tent value in the swatches panel. But if you want to be consistent and you want to make sure you always use the same colors, you can, you can, you can even store them here. And you see they're named automatically. You can drag them up and down here and reorganize them, and uh, however you want them to look over here. And uh, if you want, you can, of course, you can take all these colors and delete them because you're probably not going to use them anyway. So, uh, so um, that's that's you know, if you open up a document somebody else has created, it often looks like this. It's just the custom colors, and you skip those. Uh, other silly colors. So I'm going to save my document again. So next for the um, for the typography, right? That's the you know probably the most important thing. Uh, the reason I want to use uh, create the colors first is not really necessary to do that first. But uh, for some of these styles, I, w I might want to use colors, right? My, maybe I want to use for quotes. I want to use that blue text, you know, blue color on the text, or maybe I want to some orange lines above or below some of my my uh, subheads or something like that. So it's, it's, it's a good thing to do. So then you have it done with, you know, you get those colors out of the way. So um, so how do you create styles then? It's only one here is called basic paragraph style. Again, it's in brackets. It means you can't delete it or rename it. But you can change the properties of it. You can double click it and you can change the properties. That, that's the reason you can't delete it is that this is the place where the default topography for this document is stored. Right? So you can't delete it. it, it InDesign has to have it somewhere, right? And this is this is it. This is where it's at. 
So uh, we don't really use the basic paragraph for much, but that's the default. If you start a, if you create a new text frame, that's you know what you're gonna get. What's in here? So and as I said, I do have the uh, primary text frame. Uh, so every page now automatically has this big old frame, and this symbol over here means the primary text frame. That little thing is that it's like a primary text flow through my document. I can create as many other text frames as I want, but uh, this is like the primary. So if I add the text or anything here, it will flow through. It will even, unless I prevent it, it will also add pages at the end of the document automatically, which is kind of nice if I need more space. You can turn that feature on and off. Sometimes it's annoying when pages come and go at the end of the document without you being able to control them. But whatever I want to do, I, I want to create a couple of styles. I, and the question is, how many st what styles do I need? Well, how many styles do I want? This is a textbook. I assume I will have a multi-level head headlines, and I will have pull quotes, and I will have captions, and all that stuff. So um, this, is, uh, this has to do with the production system that you will be creating with your writers, you might be your own copywriter, or you can be, uh, and by the way, this is, uh, <laughs> this is, uh, I should be nice here and say, yeah, this is where I got my information from. I did not steal the pictures, no, at least not yet. They might be in the public domain, I don't know. But I just copied the text, I removed some of the, I, I removed a lot of those reference stuff, and of course the hyperlinks and everything, but, uh, and I just added a little bit to just to because I wanted to have here in my Word document uh, ready edited and ready to go with all the necessary styles used right here, and that includes two levels. Well, it's a, it's a chapter title, and then it's the two levels of headlines uh, that you can see over here. We have a caption over here, and and I added for good measure a little um, bulleted list. And also a number list, because that takes care of most of this stuff. This is a quote over here. So what styles are being used here? And if you're not familiar with styles, uh, I think you should be, because it's one of the strongest and most uh, productivity-enhancing features of both Word and InDesign. And in, uh, on the ribbon here in Word, you see a, a little uh, style gallery up there. It doesn't show all the available styles in a Word. And Every word template has a lot of styles. So you can go in here and get a list of them over here. Uh, and this is not all of them either, because you can go in here and click options. And yeah, well, I, I already changed the document, so I'm sorry, these are all. <laughs> you can select here. The default is that it will say recommended styles on that list, OK? So you can go in here and switch to all styles. And that's in when you will find styles like the name, like caption or quote or uh, uh, all these levels of, uh, of uh, uh, bullet lists and numbers and stuff, you know, there's a lot of, look at all these styles that are in here. It's, in, it's incredible. Now, what I usually do is to go here and use this little function. The panels because it's small and easy to move around and I use it as an inspector because if I want to know what style is being applied to the headline here I click inside of it and it will tell me here it's the title and of course I see the same thing information over here right now but you know that list is long and I might be using a different ribbon so that's why I like that little panel now there's another thing that I really really love and that is the ability to get a quick view of all the styles used in this document. So in Word, I'm going to go here to the uh, View uh, ribbon, and I'm going to switch to, I can use the Outline mode or the Draft mode. Both of them will, uh, you have an option. You have to go to Preferences or Setup in Word and turn on that little width, you get enter a value for the width of the style field over there, okay? And this is so cool because this lets me 
go through the document, first of all, I can clean it up. And that could call for like a special session. We could talk for hours or, and make a, I teach that stuff actually, how to prepare a Word file for the best, most successful import to InDesign, right? So this is basically, I've tried to follow my own rules here and use styles consistently in, in Word. You see there's a title. Uh, I'm using normal. I don't like normal. I like body, you know, but if I go in here, I, yeah, I want body type, right? But I accept that the default style in, in Word, when you're not applying like a named style, that will be normal, okay? So I'm yielding uh, here and, and using normal for my body type, okay? I have list bullets over here. I have heading to normal. I'm, I'm creating like a list. I need to, I want to capture all these, this formatting when I import that file into InDesign so I don't have to do manual styling, okay? So that's why I'm creating that list. And uh, I have uh, some tables in here, some captions, stuff and stuff. It's, it's pretty random. I've not really spent a lot of, uh, uh, I spent a lot of time in here cleaning up and removing trash. It's a lot of, you know, garbage in the Word file. So uh, I tried to clean up most of that. Now you might ask and wonder, and we're going to find out, what happens if I just import that file and I haven't created any styles uh, on my own? Uh, let me show you that real quick. I'm going to create a new empty document here. I'm going to throw it away afterwards, I promise. Uh, but I'm going to I'm going to go in here in in my te my text. You know this new new document dialog box in InDesign remembers your previous settings. Now I got everything similar to you know what I did. I'm going to do a file place, and I'm going to oh here's my chilies. These are my pictures, so they, I'm allowed to use them. Uh, so I'm going to go here and find my text file, which is right here. And I'm just going to throw it in there and see what happens, right? So, uh, oh yeah, you can't, on the, on, in Windows, you can't have the file open. You have to close the file. So, um, there you go. On the Mac, you can actually place it while it's open. For some reason, I can't really understand it, but you can. So, this is what happens. This is interesting, isn't it? it what in, in the sun is buddies with work. The styles, inputs the styles definition. Now it, it looks exactly like it did in Word, right? I got the blue headlines here, the Calibri font, and so and so. And look at here, it even imports the styles. And you get this little icon here that says that style is being imported from outside of InDesign, it's not being created here. You can double click it and change the properties of it, and your document will update. So, this is not the recommended way of doing it. I mean, if you ask Adobe, if you ask experienced designers, this will work. And I mean, it's not like the end of the world, but uh, I just wanted to show you what happens if you're importing this file into a totally empty document. And it's, I mean, it's not looking bad, but I mean, I don't like the style so much in Word, but it does. You see the tables are there. And I mean, if you're happy with this, you're done. You can send it to your client and send your invoice, right? But so, yeah. If you place the word like you would the image. Yeah. So if you file place. It's not linked. It's not linked. It's not linked. It is not linked. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the default for InDesign is that in graphics, image files, and, and uh, vector and pixel graphics will by default be linked to the outside file, whereas uh, text documents and Excel spreadsheets and stuff is, are not linked. Okay. It's an option. You can change it under preferences. If you want to link to the external uh, Excel file, for instance, you will have to turn, change that in preferences and then you place it. Now, that's a, that could be a topic for a different uh, presentation, how to work with tables. And you can link to an external Excel file. And when somebody updates the data in the Excel file, the InDesign table will update automatically. But that requires planning. You, it's not out of the box. You need to, you need, and you need to do, use table styles for that. But if you have a good, robust table style set up for it, you can automate that process. And you know, or maybe you don't know, but Excel 
itself, an Excel document, can pull data from the web live, right? So, uh, I mean, we, there's a there's an interesting workflow here in the, somewhere in the background. Okay. So I could go in here and enter, go into the title, double click it, change it, and okay, and it it would work. The problem is that there's so much under the hood in in the word files. You know, so we we want InDesign to have full control over the typography. Okay. So this is what, but this this is the list of styles that I, you know, the little list that I already. What I might want to do just to have something to work with is to go in here and select some of this text, right? I can select like here's the numbered list. I can go up here, shift click over here. I can copy this stuff. But now I'm going to be I'm going back to my my document now. But now I don't want any of that word, you know, garbage at all. So I'm going to go here and paste without formatting. You know, that's a way to strip off any kind of of a. Uh, Trashy formatting and all it, it, it is nothing. I will be applying the pure basic paragraph styling to that text. Now I need to identify the parts then, you know, so I can switch back and forth uh, to my Word document. Yeah, I closed it, so let me see if I can open it up again. Yeah, there's a lot of zombie files here, so don't get don't get too scared. Uh, where's my other file? <laughs> my other file is not on, on the list. Well, I'm using uh, the owner of uh, Lumenbrights, the course center that I work for occasionally. Uh, Roman, he's uh, he's using a lot of. Uh, he's using. A, I'm, use, I'm using his laptop right now. And, uh, he's, in, he's into zombies. Just put it that way. <laughs> it's very funny. So here's my text file. So. What I would do is uh, is keep that file open. You know, after import, I will look here. That's the title. Okay, how do I want my title to look? Now, this importing this text and working with it is basically optional. I'm going to delete it again. I'm just going to uh, because the easiest way to create a style is to create a sample, just an example, right? So I'm going to go here and select my little title here. I'm going to open up the the uh, uh, character panel. Put it over here. I'm going to use the paragraph panel. Uh, where you can see I have access to everything I ever need to style my text here. And I will just going to go here, and I have a little cheat sheet, so I'm going to use uh, Garamond, Bolt. Uh, I'm actually going to use Adobe Garamond, Pro Bolt. I'm going to use, I have to look at my cheat sheet again. I'm going to do 56 points. Uh, a little detail here, if you click inside, a, except this one, of course, but I'm going to talk about if you click inside a value field in InDesign, everything in that value field gets selected. So that thing that some people do here, you know, that drag and spend a lot of time trying to select everything inside a, a value field is uh, usually redundant because all you have to do is click once and then you can start typing. So I'm going to keep the uh, uh, letting here, the line spacing, at automatic. Uh, automatic will add 20% to the font size. So usually that's kind of cool for this purpose. But it's still overlapping the body text here. So what I'm going to do now is to add a little space here at the end of the paragraph, like a quarter of an inch. Uh, excuse me, uh, 0 0.25. Yeah, that's a quarter of an inch. You see, I'm adding this uh, this value in here, and the icon here means space after the paragraph. So now I have you know a nice little space down there. Uh, so I can change this later. I just need the basic typography, in and I want to keep it clean. So how do I create this? You know, if I want to reuse this these settings, uh, of course I want to store it as a style. And the fastest way of doing that is to keep the Alt or Option key pressed down when you click the New button over here. Again, you save a double click. You know, it's amazing. So I'm going to name that the title. I'm going to make sure. I apply the style to the selection, so the example is automatically styled with the, with the correct style. And I'm going to make sure, it, this used to be checked by default, I had to create a cloud library, and thank goodness they changed it, but I turn it off anyway, because it will, it will store all, everything you create will be stored in the cloud. I mean, who wants like 200 color definitions stored in a big pile in the cloud? It's, uh, Adobe wants, yeah. Adobe wants us to do it, right? So, yeah. 
But no, you, you can use, uh, and that could be a topic for yet another interesting seminar to talk about libraries and how to really use them. I mean, useful, not just pile up junk. So there you go. So I'm going to click OK. And I'm going to keep going here. And I, I have to watch the time here a little bit. I can go here and create all these styles. But I'm going to cheat a little bit because there, there is, I have, of course, created them already. But I'm going to do the body type here. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to select this uh, paragraph. And um, I'm going to, um, let me see here. Which order should I do this? Let me do the headline one first. This is the headline one. I'm going to select that history. And then I'm going to real quick go here and I want to do uh, Myriad Pro. I want bold. I'm going to go over here and select bold. Remember, in the Adobe world, you have two menus to select the font, whereas a lot of other, pro other programs only use like one menu. But it's the family menu and then it's the family members. So that's why we have two menus for the font over here. And I want to do quick and easy here. I want to do 18 points. I'm going to leave the um, um, uh, line spacing at automatic. Um, I'm going to have a little space above my titles over here. Uh, my subtitles is going to be point, uh, 0 0.375. And that's two Picos three points if you want. And then I want to do uh, uh, I want to do a couple of things here. First, I want to make it. I want to have. Why didn't I get that font? I want to do Marriott Pro. Probably forgot about it. Bold. It's not sticking. Okay. What, what am I doing wrong? Here? Marriott Pro. What the, they don't want to give it to me. Eighteen point, so and so. I want a little uh, space above. Uh, I want a little uh, space below. That's going to be. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to do that little line now. I can add lines, you know, like horizontal lines above and below every paragraph uh, or in every paragraph style. Usually, I do that in the style, but you can also do it here from the fly out menu in the on the paragraph panel. Just open up that fly up menu and you select paragraph rules. So what I'm doing is just creating a sample of what I really want to do. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to add a rule uh, two point wide. I'm going to lift it up a little bit so it's nice there. Uh, it's, the offset is quarter of an inch. And I want to use that color A, you know, my orange color. You know. So for this, I also would want to have a little bit space below, I think. It's not on my list, but I want to do a little bit space below. So I'm going to go back here and just add a little bit space below. Okay, so the way, the easiest way to create a style would be to just select a sample and start styling it. And when you're done, that's when you have the option, rhetorically speaking or asking. I mean, I style this title now. I have another one down here somewhere. I'm going to do use that like 25 places. Do you want to repeat that process and do all that manually all over again? Y'all, be my guest if you want. What I want to do is just alt-click the new button over here, and I'm going to call this heading one. I oh, that was uh, caps lock. Uh, heading one, and I'm because I'm super lazy. I'm taking care to use exactly the same wording, uh, name of the style as the word templates are using. I don't have to do that, but I, I want to do it because I'm lazy in the most productive meaning of the word, right? I want as little to do with this as, as I can. Because what you're going to see in a moment is that if the style already exists in InDesign with the identical name, including uppercase, lowercase, and spaces and everything, the incoming style will be identified by InDesign and InDesign will take over the styling. So, you know, that's what we want. I'm going to do one more little thing here, and then I'm going to import the other styles from the 
from the Reddit document. So you don't have to watch me do all this over and over again. But it's it's pretty fast, you know, it's a pretty quick thing to do. I just want to do one more thing, and that's in this shortcut field. I want to do, since I'm on uh, Windows right now, I'm going to do Control and the numeric keypad 1. I want to be able to apply this style by using a keyboard shortcut. And all the keys on the numeric uh, keypad on both Mac and Windows in InDesign uh, are reserved for use with uh, user-defined shortcuts for style. So you can use any modifier keys, you know, shift all, option, command, whatever. So it's about a hundred different combinations, you know, so you, you, you will never, probably never run out. I'm just going to do command or control one, two, three for headline one, headline two, and body type text, right? So I'm just going to add here, you, you just, to define it, you just stay in that field and you just do the control one, and there you go. It will say here if it's, um, if you use the same shortcut before, it used it for something different, it will tell you right there, you know, that it's in use somewhere else. But this will, you know, take over. So apply style to selection and OK, and I can keep going here. The same thing will go for uh, body type here, and uh, and um, I think I should just uh, move on, do the, do the, do the little cheating, the important thing. And it's not really cheating, it's just being smart, you know. Uh, and since I already done it, you know, I'm, I'm basically doing what I told you you should never do. You're doing the same thing manually over and over again. So I'm going to go to the paragraph style flyout menu here. Um, uh, there's two commands. could be a little confusing. It says load paragraph styles and load all text styles. Now, the other type of text styles in addition to paragraph styles are character styles. So, uh, and it really doesn't matter as long as you know what you're doing uh, in the next dialog box, it doesn't really matter because what happens is uh, you will get this, uh, well, the first question you get is what file do you want to take this from, okay? So I'm going to grab this one and you have this, if you have copied the files, you can, you know, the 2B file has already got the styles in there, okay? So I'm just going to import them from there. And what's going to happen now is that you get a list of all the styles in that other document. And they're all checked. You, there's no point importing the basic paragraph style. So I'm going to, going to uncheck that. It doesn't really do any harm, but you know, it's, it's, it's redundant. So in the other document, I have heading one. And in this document, it says it's a conflict because I already have created one. So I, it's, it's like one incoming and one here already. I want to use the incoming. So I get it consistent. So, and here's the number of styles that I created in the other document. It's, uh, it's the same as we have, uh, you know, I showed you in the Word document, and there's a few extra ones. So, and then, since I chose paragraph styles, these are, look at this, there's, a, there's some styles here. This is one, some of that trashy stuff that comes, can come in with a, with a Word document if you're, you know, unlucky. It's like uh, all kinds of character and, and paragraph styles from Word, and you don't want it. So in this case, I, I would have unchecked them anyway if they were checked. So the only difference between those two commands, import uh, or load paragraph styles and load all text styles, is that in this case, only the paragraph styles will be checked. And with the other option, the character styles will also be checked. So that's the only difference between the two. So you can do check all, uncheck all, just check, you know, import only the ones you want anyway. So in this case, I'm going to do this. And now I have, yeah, I want to organize these. Uh, they're not really in the order I want them. The title, I'm not going to use that much. So I'm going to put that at the bottom. I want heading one, heading two, and body. So, and I put them on control one, two, three, okay? So I can go up here and I can say, this is a title, this is a title two, this is a, a body type, you know, I can go here and do this really, really quick. I can say, this is body type, uh, like this, you know, I created uh, some, uh, a little guy here called list bullet, kind of nice, and numbers and everything, you know, so you, you don't need to watch me create all these styles all over again because they're right there. So, with that said, since now uh, we, we should put this to a test, right, and see what happens when I import the file now. So, uh, my prediction or my statement is that 
uh, InDesign will look for incoming styles. And the weird word for it is if the incoming style has the same name as, as the one style in InDesign, InDesign calls it a conflict. I would call it a match because that's like a dance and table and, and party, right? Uh, they call it a conflict, but InDesign will take over control, you know, and apply InDesign style to the text. So let's see if that really is going to be exciting. Uh, so I'm going to do a file place. Here and oh, which uh, oh yeah, it's this one. It's the clean one. It's a little bit cleaner than the one that's only clean. So the clean one is, is better. So uh, if I just click open here, I will not get a dialog box or anything. It will just use the default settings for incoming Word files, and it will place it in my documents. Of course, I have to close it again. I thought I already said that, but I forgot it. So yeah. So I need to, yeah, here it is. Look at that. I got the style here, the title, the body. And by the way, uh, I didn't mention that because I didn't create the body style. I do, by principle, I want the body style, right? Because that's what I want from it. I did create the style called normal. And I'm going to show you how I created it because it's just a 100% identical copy of body. So. When you have, if I'm applying body here, you see it doesn't change. These two styles are identical. So if I apply a style to a text like this, this is body type, and I want to create, I'm going to create a new style. I name it something, in this case normal. I can't, you know, I will get an error message because it already exists. And then I just do this. I say based on body, and then I click OK. I don't do anything. It's just a 100% copy of the body. And if I later make changes to the body style, the normal style will update automatically as well. Because it's again, it's like a like a parent-child relationship when you when you base one style on another. All right. So is this working? We're uh, I mean, <laughs> it's a lot of work to do here, but we are getting somewhere. Aren't we? So uh, I hope you're getting something out of this. So I'm going to save my document. We can we can take a look at it. This is far from complete, you know. I'm going to uh, press the tab key. If you ever press the tab key by mistake, uh, in the uh, it's like your user interface disappears, right? Uh, but it's a function. It's not a fault. It's a function. The tab key will just instantly hide all the panels, and you can press the tab key again, and everything will come back. There's even a subset to that. You can do the shift tab. And that will keep the toolbox and the control panel and hide all the other panels. So, I mean, well, some of us don't have... Yes, it is. And uh, some of us don't have anything better to do than read the list of shortcuts in InDesign. By the way, it's uh, 35 pages, last time I printed it. And you get them here. If you go to Edit, Keyboard Shortcuts, you see there's a button here that says Show Set. There you go. And I recommend, don't read this uh, at bedtime, because it's so exciting you won't get to sleep. <laughs> well, let me, let me say, I, it is exciting. There, is a, there are commands in here that are not documented, that are not anywhere else in, this, in the system. Let me show you. It's, uh, oh, I'm, no, I'm, that costs money. <laughs> it's edit keyboard shortcuts. And then you click Show Set. You can select a different set here. If you have different sets here, you can select the different set. You can create your own set. And you can say Show Set. I found a way to, I was using Excel. I, I put all this stuff into Excel from different sets. And I, I created a, an Excel formula to tell me where they're different. Right. If, you, if you don't have anything better to do, you can do stuff like that. But I have read this wonderful document. I printed it. It was literally 35 pages, but I'm going to do save all. Who, up with one hand, if, who knew about the save all command in any time? Say, if you have a lot of open documents and you make changes to, to, you don't even remember which one, there is a command that will save all open documents. How about that? And it's the, it's the short key that is not so short. It's all the three modifier keys. And S, right? That sounds dangerous too. 
And it works with W as well, close all documents. So that sounds dangerous. Yeah. But uh, it's not as dangerous as the April Fool's thing you can do with your InDesign colleagues. Because you can, you, can, you can edit the shortcuts, right? You can change any shortcuts. <laughs> and if you want to be nice to your colleague, just go in and switch control S and control W. So every time they save a document, it will close the document. Ooh. <laughs> there is a, I mean, if we're going to be nerdy here, you can, you can Google InDesign pranks. I mean, stuff like that. You can, you know there's a setting, huh? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, and let's. You know, there's. Uh, do, you, do you know what Greek text is? It's not it has nothing to do with the language. If I zoom out here, uh, uh, up to a point where the type gets so small that it, there's no point in design to say I don't bother. This is just text, you know. So you have to zoom in to see it. But there's a view threshold in the preference to to set where that kicks in. And you can go in on your colleague's computer and set that to like 100 points or something, or 200 points, right? So all text will be shown in Greek in all his documents. How cool is that? How cool is that? <laughs> it is evil. But it's not as destructive as the Control w or Control s switch, you know, so anyway. All right. So here we go. So we we actually getting places here. You see, I, uh, I have the... Um, I have the levels of, um, uh, well, you see this, uh, this is about time to talk a little bit about the new functions of this program. Um, oh yeah, time is flying. We are having fun. You can't have more fun than you can have in InDesign, right? Well, anyway, um, I, I'm going to create the header and footer next, I think. But um, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a new panel in InDesign called properties and like in Photoshop. like in Photoshop except in Photoshop is useful uh, <laughs> so what do you think I mean we have the control panel right well, everything here character level settings paragraph level settings oh we got the new panel with characters character level settings and And I usually use those panels that I was just using. You know, the I usually have the uh, the character panel open and the and the, and the paragraph panel open. And I can I can fill my screen now with the same information repeated and repeated and repeated. So, except for this thing, you have uh, you have access to the paragraph styles and character styles, which I always have in a separate panel anyway. Um, change case, new hyperlink. There's some there's some stuff here. But it's a new panel. I, I think, I hope that with a little time and effort and feedback from users, they will tweak this a little bit and make it a little bit more useful. Because now it's like a now it's like a vertical replica of the control panel, basically. So I mean, go figure. And um, and uh, that might be useful. It, it, it's like a, but you know, in in the, in the Photoshop is totally awesome, and in Illustrator too, it's really really cool. So they added it here. Uh, I can't see why you would use the control panel and this panel at the same time. You can even expand these two uh, sections, you know, the paragraph level settings. And, the, and now I literally have everything three times on my screen, right? So, uh, but, but it, it, it does apply, the cool thing is that it does apply to all kinds of objects, right? So you have a little bit, of, again, I'm not going to go on and on about it, but I'm a little skeptic because I love the control panel always using the control panel if I can. So now I have one more place. If, you, if we had time now, we could do a little comparison. You know, what, what is here and what that is not there and the other way around. And uh, so it's a new panel called properties. Okay. So we should give them feedback. You know, Adobe listens to feedback. You know the, uh, the dreaded uh, start screen? It's my Photoshop. Here's Photoshop. You know the, the start screen that everybody turned off, and every time I had a chance, chance when I'm teaching or whatever, when I'm here, I say, you should turn it into a home screen, just like an Acrobat, right? And in in Photoshop now, they did just that, right? So 
we're waiting for that thing in InDesign. It came, it came to Illustrator and Photoshop this time around. I'm hoping like February we'll, we will get it. Yeah, they will probably do it here as well. Because I don't want to use a, uh, that start screen. You have to close all your open documents to get to that start screen. Who will ever, what kind of workflow is that? Yeah. But now you've got the home screen and, and I mean the home button over there, little house. Uh, I expect soon to see a little house here at the left hand side of the control panel. Or maybe they kill the control panel altogether. They want us to use that vertical version instead. I don't know. But we'll see. Okay, so, um, all right. So let me uh, create those headers and footers. And then we're going to talk a little bit about graphics and anchor graphics. And I think that's basically what I've made you know, within the time frame. Well, anyway, so the prerequisite of using uh, live running header footers is to use styles systematically. And by the way, I heard this, uh, I think I was talking to myself or something. You know, uh, the, I, I, I heard about the three cues, the three cues. Why would you use styles? You know, it's um, three <coughs> cues. Uh, this, is, this is a little nerdy, too. It's a uh, quantity, right? You're going to use style because it makes you more productive, okay? And then you're going to use styles because of quality. Because, that's the no extra key. Because it makes your styling consistent and easy, you know. And then you're going to use it because it makes you creative. So, uh, because you, <laughs> it's kind of silly, uh, but it invites you to experiment, right? When you have applied styles uh, uh, consistently around your document, you can change a uh, little bit, bit here, a little bit there. You can, you can go and, um, and uh, you know, change the font size of the subheads and all the whole document with, with update. So these are the three most important reasons why you want to use uh, styles. But if you want to create a table of contents, if you want to, uh, well, make live running header footers, you need to use styles consistently. And you need to know what styles are. So I'm going to use the title style, the, history, the uh, heading one, and the heading two. Now, in order to use those, I have to create a couple of uh, user variables. And that's on the type menu. It's called text variables. And you see here on the insert variable list, uh, it's grayed out now because I'm not inside the text frame. Uh, so you have chapter number, creation date, file name, image name, last page number, so and so. All this stuff that is already defined for us. What I use a lot in my well, a lot of documents, I use the output date because if I create a PDF, I include it so it will actually tell me when, when exactly the date and the time when that PDF was created. That Wait, could, that you can, you can in, anywhere in any text frame, you can insert these variables. If you visible or invisible in your document, you can insert uh, any of these text variables, and some of them are predefined, chapter number, creation date, and so and so. What I find useful is this. It's the output date, right? It's the date today. And there should be time here as well. I, I, I thought it would uh, give me the time as well. But, uh, well, it's, it doesn't really matter. You can, you can, oh, modification date. Maybe that's, it. yeah, that's the one I wanted. The modification date and the output date. So, I, I put that in an you know in a secret little place in the document. It will be part of the PDF. And it prints when you make a PDF. Of it. it will what? It shows up. Oh yeah. If you, I mean, it's up to you. You can, you can, uh, you can make it a non-printing. You know, yeah. you can make it here. Um, we discussed that somewhere. You always on the output attributes. Have you ever seen this panel? It's it's huge. Look at that. It's got one option. Non-print. So when I turn on non-printing, what do you think if I do a print preview? It's gone. Right? And then you can, when you create a PDF, you can say include non-printing objects. So 
So if, if it's your archive purposes, you want to record the, the date and time, I find that very useful. But of course, the, 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 my client and the readers shouldn't see this thing. It's like for internal use, right? So that's why I either put them in the place where nobody will find it, or uh, I make it known. So let's uh, do the, the header and footer. I, I, uh, this is not, I always run out of time because I digress and stuff, but I mean, what we cover is important, so we, we should uh, probably you know, just be happy about that. So let me go back here to my, um, I'm gonna do, open up the pages panel, go back to my master. Um, I'm going to draw a quick little frame over here going to apply my wonderful blue color to to uh, the header. I'm going to apply it to the uh, stroke as well. Um, I'm going to duplicate that real quick over to the right hand side. Uh, you alt drag. Just hold on the alt or option key when you drag like you're moving. You'll be making a copy. So I'm going to create a little text file, uh, text frame here. And um, just going to type some random text here first. And, and, um, I want these to be, see if I can uh, manage to do that, uh, Myriad Pro Bold. Uh, I want all caps, so I'm going to turn on uh, all caps. I don't want to type it in. When you, when you use the function for all caps, you can turn it on and off. Maybe later I change my mind. So I want this one here, and I want it, uh, I want it white. Paper, I should say. So I'm going to put it here, and I can I can change the color of the type. Even though you see, if I uh, if I have the text frame selected like this, and and I open up, for instance, the, the uh, instance of the uh, swatches panel here at the top screen, you see it's set to uh, change the frame. So if I add a color now, it will be the frame. But I can switch to the text level here, and and switch to paper. You know, like here. If I, see, you don't have to. You know, go. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So for for text frame, if you select the text frame, uh, it's uh, it's you can go here. Like I said, you see, it's no fill, no stroke. But if you go over here, you know, it's been here. I last book I wrote was CS6, and, and it was definitely there. I think it was older than that. So. But anyway, I got this one. And I'm duplicating this frame over here. And just for fun, I'm going to select both of these frames. And I'm going to use uh, uh, the justification. You see, there's two justifications here that you really don't have in any other program. It's align towards spine or align from spine. So in this case, I want to align from spine. You know, So I am using the same setting. If I move a frame over from one side to the other, it will it will switch. Yeah. So that's another cool little thing. And now for the variables. I have to create three ones, but I'm going to do it real quick. So text variables define. And I get that list of existing ones because you can you can select either one of these guys and you just click new and you will get a copy. So you get a jump start if you want to create a, uh, a new variable. You just pick the one that you know rips, resembles the one you're going to use. So I'm clicking run, running header and click new. This is going to be uh, my title. It says you're running header based on paragraph styles. Wonderful. That's exactly what I want. What paragraph style are you going to look for? The title paragraph style. If there's more on, of the same style on the same page, do you want to use the first or the last one? That'd be fine. I want to use the first one. And that's it. I'm going to do OK. And I've created a variable. I keep it selected and I click new. I will get a copy of that. I'm going to call this heading one. And this is going to be my running header for heading one. And first on page. Uh, and I'm just going to duplicate that again and call it head two. It doesn't have to take any longer than this. Uh, and that, of course, is going to look for the heading two style. I'm going to click OK. And now I have defined my variables. Now. Uh, why would you have the first on page and last on page? That's, that's super, super useful. I've, I've been involved in creating stuff like uh, dictionaries and stuff like that, and you know, or phone books and stuff, you know, on the top 
left side, you want the first entry on the left-hand side. And, and on the top of the right-hand side, you want the last entry on the right-hand side. So it's a part of the user interface for the book, right? So you can see on this page, I will see you know everything from there to there. And that's why you create two variables, one for the first and one for the last. So in this case, I'm just going to go in here and I'm going to, oh, I missed the color things here. That wasn't nice. How do I do that? Oh, it's the tent thing. Okay. So, uh, is it that? oh, there we go. Oh, it's a bit better. So anyway, uh, I'm just going to go in here. You know you can double click to enter a text frame. That's a time saver of dimensions. I'm just selecting all this text. I don't want that text there anymore. I'm going to do type text variables, insert variable, and here's all my, uh, all my, you know, my new ones. Head one, head two, title. I want title here, and I want a space and a, and a little dash there, and then I want uh, insert text variable um, heading one. And over here, I want the head two. So I'm selecting, of course, I didn't have to enter that uh, place all the text there initially. That was just to just do the styling, right? So I want the head. I want the, the chapter title and the section name on the top left, and I want the subtitle on the right hand side. And I'm going to go over here to my page and see how that's working. So I'm going to do the Shift W again. It says here, Chili Pepper Dash History, right? And over here, it will interestingly enough is using the last. One. So I'm not sure, sure. I think it's like it's like still going over here. So he's actually looking for the one on the right hand page. And here it's. Uh, I think that is really really cool. Of course, you can enter anything you want here. Like uh, uh, any, you can you can grab any style that you're using systematically to, to increase the uh, the usability readability of the book. You know, to go like this. And by the way, you see here the uh, the tables are converted automatically. Not necessarily uh, correct uh, width and stuff, but you can, depending on how you want this to look, you can, uh, you can, working with tables is just another topic. Somebody should be taking notes. We, we could do, we could do a special, we can do a special on, on, on working with tables, you know. And again, you see that uh, it's pretty obvious that uh, InDesign and, and words are really, really good friends because the, the, the tables are converted. And one thing I was going to talk about here, uh, I know I need to close soon, but uh, I was supposed to talk a little bit about what's new in InDesign, and I mean, besides the wonderful new um, properties panel. Um, uh, one cool little thing is one of the tiniest little things. It's useful for stuff like this. And some people, I'm sure, have been waiting for this and asking for this for years, but it's the smallest little thing. I, have you ever been working with bulleted list or numbered list? And you need to have a little space above the first one, a little bit extra space below the last one. So I've, I've actually sometimes ended up with having three styles, one for the first bullet point and one for the last bullet point, and then for the ones in between. Now, they recently uh, added the tiniest little thing to this program. And it's on the paragraph level. And uh, normally it would look like this. So these numbered lists uh, look like this. I can go in here and look at the look at the style, and it says here uh, that it's a space after. I need a little space after you know each of these paragraphs because if it's if it's if the last line and yeah, I want to shift to the to the body type, I want that little extra space. And the problem is. What then between the same entries, in you know, the same entries using the same style? Okay, that's the and that's what they added this fall. And and I was just looking at that thing and hey, I never thought about that. This could be really useful. You know, so I can go in here and said so. The default setting is ignore, which means it will work like the way it's always been working because because of backwards compatibility. I guess they had to do that. So I go in here and switch to zero. You know. <laughs> So it will not use, it will only use that, it, it will honor the space above and the space below, but not apply it between when it's the same style as well. Yeah, it's just one of those tiny little things. 
And you know what? Adobe, uh, the Adobe team over there in uh, in San Jose in in, uh, in California, they have a name for this. Those tiny little changes to programs. It's, they have like uh, what they call it, like LDI days, let's do it days. Uh, think about these ambitious programmers. They want to work on big projects and big new functions and whatever. Nobody wants to do like this, right? And, and tiny little things. And so two or three times a year, and I have this from you know people very close to the core of Adobe. They two or three times a year, they, and it's planned ahead. You know, we're gonna do a let's do it day. Nobody is allowed to work on those big projects in those days. You are only going to do little things like this, like the users have been asking for. So it's no, you, know, you don't lose face by, you know, doing stuff like this. And so if you didn't have the style to do that, mm -hmm. would you just curtain that by hand? Or I mean, let it by hand? Or would that be too unstylish to do that? I would never do that manually if I could avoid it. But yeah, you can do that. But that will, you will, you will change the, uh, you may change the, uh, you the letting. You that one place, right? Hmm? Oh yeah, exactly. You can manually go in here and add some space after for the last one. Yeah, would I would that never do that. Really. No, and <laughs> no, I no, I don't. That's so interesting. Yeah, I would never do that because because my clients change their minds all the time. Suddenly they want to add a fourth point, right? They will. Add, they, there's a, suddenly there's another paragraph, and then I will have to do manual work again, and I don't like that. My, I have a tutor who once he was terrible. I mean he was. Genius, but he was terrible. He said, "Tom, if you want to be lazy, do it right the first time." Yeah. And I hate that. Well, but that's it, a great thing. It is true. It is true. But I hate. I mean, if somebody tells you yeah. because you've been cutting some corners, right, and you have to redo it, and well, it's true. So, and again, it's not a hundred uh, percent analogy there, but I rather create a, a workflow system that is uh, uh, sustainable, right? I will catch all the varieties here. And this little function that I would never even have thought about, it was, I was looking at it and what on earth does that mean? Ooh, and you got the little revelation. Oh, I know what it means. It's crazy. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to use it. Saves me two or three styles in the document. Okay. So I think I'm running out of time and I was going to do uh, graphics and anchored objects, but I guess I'm going to put that on the big list for uh, some future. And poor Donna, she's the one who wanted me to do anchored objects, so that's, that's why I'm sitting here. That, <laughs> that's why I'm sitting here. Uh, or I could do something else that I can invoice somebody for. <laughs> but it, the deal is this. What you, I, I did talk about it here initially, so uh, we can do this real quick. You see these little, these are grouped objects. I got the little picture here. I got the caption. Uh, the clue is to group them before you anchor them. So I, I create little placeholders for that so I can, you know. Have, so you don't want to anchor the, the, the picture and the caption individually. But in this case, you will see here it should work. Um, let me see over here. If, if this text moves, you know, that thing moves with it, right? So that's, that's what you want. It's outside, but it's, you see that little anchor? It is anchored. If I if I go in here and I show hidden characters, you will see. Incidentally, I put that little thing right in the little the middle of this word. It's like a little sign in there. Usually, I I put those little anchors at the beginning or at the end of a paragraph. But uh, in this case, I just uh, dragged it in there. So let me. And I and I know I'm on overtime here, and we're gonna win the year subscription for the Creator Cloud, right? So I'm going to copy this anchored frame because if you copy an anchored frame and paste it again, of course the copy isn't anchored anywhere. Uh, so um, uh, it's, it's like a free floating group, right? And with this placeholder for the image, I can place any image in there, of course, at a later point. But the easiest way to anchor is to use that little blue little uh, adornment uh, here at the top. You could just press down and drag here and place it in there, you know, and then it will flow. Now, there is a little bit more to it when it comes to, um, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to sit on this side, but if it incidentally happens to go on the left-hand side, I wanted to switch sides, right? And 
that is set up over here. So that's a setting, and see if we can make it work. I'm not, I don't even remember if I did it with this one, but if I go in here, first of all, there's a keep inside frame function that I turned on. You see keep inside frame. See, it doesn't slide down when I go down here. And if I go all the way down, well, I can't make it mirrored, but let me do that. I almost closed the document. Uh, did somebody mess up the save and the... Uh, anyway, uh, if, if for some reason this text moves, I'm going to press enter here now. If that text moves over to the other side, it jumps over to the other side because towards the spine and away from the spine, right? This is what I was going to show you, but I mean, so we can, we can do a one-on-one -on -one for that. I have one more little thing, and that's going to be, isn't that what Steve Jobs always said? One more thing. And of course, I lost my place here. Let, let me do one more thing. I'm going to undo all these um, crazy little uh, lines I made there. Where, where's that line that, yeah, look at this. This is terrible, isn't it? This title incidentally happened to come on the top of, be on the top of a column. And the line above, because of the offset value, is, ex is above the line. So how can we change that? Let's um, look inside the style. By the way, have you ever tried to double click a style to edit it and then you, that style gets applied to whatever text you have selected? If you hold down all the three modifier keys, Shift, Alt, Command, I mean, what, whatever, Shift, Control, Alt, or Option, you know, the drill. If you hold all those three down when you double click a style, it will not apply the style to the current uh, selection. If you go by here and see paragraph, paragraph rules, what do you think this means? What does it say? Keep in frame. Yeah, I like about that. See, it's above the frame, uh -huh. and, I go, and I have this keep in frame. Yes, please. Woohoo! There you go. Well, that should conclude my little presentation. I hope you got something out of it. Have we?